recording before I forget as well. So we have different types of muscles. Remember the different types of muscle tissue, depending on where it's located. Uh, skeletal muscle tissue is found attached to all of your bones. It will have those zebra stripes or striations appearing on them. Um, and they will be voluntarily controlled. I mean, you control when you move your skeleton. You control when those skeletal muscles contract, which move the bones of your body. Cardiac muscle tissue is located in the walls of your heart. It's also striated with those stripes to it. Um, and it is involuntarily controlled, meaning your heart contracts without you telling it to. It's subconsciously controlled. Smooth muscle is found in the um, blood vessels, the walls of your hollow organs. It is non-striated, so it has a very smooth appearance to it, and it's also involuntarily controlled, meaning you're not telling your digestive tract or your stomach when to push food along. So that's what involuntary control means. And the different functions of the muscle system in general. So remember, when we're talking about muscle system, we talk about all the types of muscle tissue, whether they're your skeletal muscles, your heart muscles, or smooth muscle tissue, which is found throughout as well. Um, but your muscle system functions to move parts of the body to maintain our posture, uh, to help you breathe. That's what respiration is, inhale and exhaling. Uh, your skeletal muscles will help to produce body heat by shivering, by moving. Your skeletal muscle or your muscular system can communicate with each other. It will establish heartbeats and helps to contract different organs and vessels. So your smooth muscle surrounds your blood vessels to help constrict your blood vessels or dilate blood vessels. And also contraction of some of your organs include contraction of your intestines to push food along, contraction of your stomach to push contents out of the stomach into your intestines. Um, as well as even contraction of the uterus, which happens automatically, involuntarily as well. So your muscles have special unique properties. They have the ability to contract, which just means they can shorten forcefully. So that's what contractility is. They can shorten forcefully. Your um, muscles have the ability to be excitable or innervated, so they can respond to a stimulus. So your muscles can respond to a nervous stimulus. They have the ability to be extensible, which means they can stretch beyond normal resting length, and then they can still contract, um, still shorten. And then elasticity means they can recoil to their original resting length after they have been stretched. So we'll talk through the different types of muscles. Skeletal muscle structure, first of all, also called striated muscle. Um, it consists of, or it constitutes about 40% of our body weight. So your muscles consist of about 40% of your body weight. And we know that by exercising, weightlifting, our muscles can increase in size. So usually that's just one thing to consider. If you are a big weightlifter or you're trying to gain more muscle mass, you will increase your weight because as those muscles get bigger, your weight will get larger as well. And skeletal muscle is named that because the muscles are attached to the bones of your skeletal system. Some of our skeletal muscles are attached to the skin. Um, some of the muscles in the face that produce our facial expressions like smiling, frowning. Um, so those are just attached to your skin, whereas other skeletal muscles are connected, connected to some connective tissue sheets that we'll go over. So our skeletal muscle structure is striated because transverse bands or striations can be seen under a microscope and individual skeletal muscles such as your biceps brachii are known as a complete organ because they are comprised of several tissues which make up organs. So they, your biceps brachii, for example, includes all the muscle tissue, all the nervous tissue and all of the connective tissue. So some of our muscles are um, considered complete organs in and of themselves. We have different um, kind of layers of connective tissue that cover parts of the muscle. So each kind of entire skeletal muscle is surrounded by a connective tissue sheath, which we call the epimysium. Um, whenever you see the word mys or my or myo or mysium, that usually is a word stem that has to do with muscles. And this epi prefix has to do with above. So kind of the outer covering of the entire muscle is called your epimysium. 
And then your skeletal muscle is subdivided into groups of muscle cells, which we call fascicles. And each fascicle is covered by the perimecium. Each skeletal muscle cell, and from here on out, you'll notice that we call skeletal muscle cells, we also call them muscle fibers. So when I say muscle fiber, I mean muscle cell. Each skeletal muscle cell or fiber is surrounded by connective tissue covering um, termed the endomecium. And endo means kind of inner or inside of. Um, so that's where we get that endo prefix. So that's where we get some connective tissues and how they cover the muscle itself. And then I'll eventually show you kind of a picture um, describing and showing this kind of arrangement. Um, a muscle fiber itself is a single cylindrical cell with several nuclei always pushed to the periphery, so kind of the outer region. Uh, muscle fibers, muscle cells, again, so we use those two words interchangeably. A muscle fiber is a muscle cell. It can be anywhere from one to 30 centimeters in length, but they're generally about um, 0.15 millimeters in diameter. Um, Skeletal muscle fibers, again, will contain several nuclei located at their periphery. And we have uh, different kind of names for these muscle cells. The sarcolemma is just the plasma membrane or cell membrane. And it has many tube-like inward folds called transverse tubules or T-tubules. So the cell membrane that surrounds each muscle cell or muscle fiber kind of folds in on itself. And wherever you have an inward fold, we call that the T-tubule. And T-tubules occur at regular intervals along the muscle fiber. They will extend deep within to the center of the muscle fiber, and we'll see why that is. Uh, the T-tubules will also be associated with enlarged portions of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But in muscle fibers, we call the smooth ER sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that will, those kind of um, structures will have a very important role in how our muscles will contract. And the enlarged portions are called terminal cisternae. And when we combine them together, where the T-tubules connect the sarcolemma uh, to the terminal cisternae, we call that a muscle triad. And again, I will show you a picture here in about one more slide. Um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is very important because it stores calcium inside of it. And that's just very important to get into your head now. The sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium because that will be huge for how our muscles will contract. And the cytoplasm else inside the muscle fiber, instead of calling it the cytoplasm, we call it the sarcoplasm. And it will contain many bundles of protein filaments. And these protein filaments are called myofibrils, which consist of the myofilaments, actin, and myosin. And these myofilaments, actin and myosin, are kind of how we contract our muscles. So we'll come back and talk a lot about actin and myosin today too. So here we have the structure of a skeletal muscle. Um, let's just go through it starting at the top. We have an entire muscle shown here showing that the muscle connected to a bone is done via a tendon. And the whole muscle is surrounded by the epimecium connective tissue layer. And you can see here, we pull out these bundles of muscle fibers and bundles of muscle fibers are called a muscle fascicle. So that's what's shown here. This is a one muscle fascicle. It's just a bundle of muscle fibers. Here's another muscle fascicle. Um, and the muscle uh, fascicles, I don't think it's labeled, but muscle fascicles are covered um, with this connective tissue covering, kind of shown in blue there, and that's the um, perimecium. And then if we kind of pull out each individual muscle fiber from those fascicles, you remember a muscle fiber is a muscle cell. You can see here the muscle cells or muscle fibers are surrounded by endomeciums. And the endomeciums are the connective tissue covering that surround the muscle fiber cells themselves. And what we've sh shown here, we've zoomed in on an individual muscle fiber here to show you how the muscle fiber itself is arranged. So you can see what makes up the muscle fiber um, are bundles of myofibrils. And we'll talk about what those are, the actin and myosin protein filaments. But the muscle fiber itself, you can see how 
the sarcoplasmic reticulum is shown in yellow. So, you know, if we look on the outside, this is considered the sarcolemma is the cell membrane and the sarcoplasma is everything inside the cell. Um, the sarcolemma, you can kind of see here how there's deep kind of infoldings to the sarcolemma. And this is what we call the T tubule. So whenever you kind of have an infolding that goes deep within the muscle fiber, that's called the transverse or T tubule. And then on either side of the T tubule, you see these enlarged portions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum called the terminal cisternae. And combined, we call that a triad, the T tubule, and then the enlarged portions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum on each side called the terminal cisternae. And it's really important to get just a good understanding, spending some time understanding the anatomy of the muscle fiber, because when we talk about how your muscles will contract, I'll use a lot of this same terminology when we go through the steps. So you see in the muscle fiber, you have capillaries, um, you'll have mitochondria because remember what mitochondria do in a cell, they create ATP or energy and your skeletal muscles need a lot of ATP to contract. And again, we'll find out why in a little bit, but let's zoom in. So here's one individual, again, muscle fiber or muscle cell. Um, but if we go down to kind of the next step, we see how myofibrils are the bundles. So here is a myofibril bundle, and it's made up of myofilaments, which are the actin and myosin. And those actin and myosin, those will be the protein filaments that are going to slide past each other and contract to cause your muscles to shorten. And whenever a muscle contracts, it shortens, and that shortening then pulls on a part of the body that is trying to move. So that is the structure of skeletal muscle. Um, and we wanna make sure we have a good understanding of that before we kind of continue. So we'll now talk about the sarcomere. So we're kind of really gonna zoom in here on the actin and myosin of your myofibrils. And the sarcomere is your basic structural and functional unit of a skeletal muscle because it's the smallest portion of a skeletal muscle capable of contracting. And we'll go through kind of what makes up the parts of a sarcomere. Um, and again, you know, in lab, we'll go over a lot of this again. So um, there's just a lot of information, especially in these next two chapters. So just keep that in mind if you're already feeling um, a little overwhelmed. But the sarcomere um, is just the basic structural and functional unit of a skeletal muscle because it'll be the smallest portion of a skeletal muscle that can contract. And the Z disc are kind of our boundaries from one sarcomere to the next. Z discs kind of form this network of protein fibers that serve as an anchor for our actin myofilaments. And they just separate one sarcomere from the next. So again, a sarcomere will extend from, the, from one Z disc to the next Z disc. And I'll show you again what that means with a picture eventually. We'll talk about how actin and myosin are organized. Uh, to give our skeletal muscles their striation. So our actin and myosin, again, are organized, they kind of um, sit parallel to each other, and then they'll contract by sliding past each other, but it's the arrangement of them that give the skeletal muscle the striations or stripes to them, and will help them eventually contract. So your myofilaments will slide past each other, causing sarcomeres to shorten, and each sarcomere consists of two light, lighter staining bands separated by a darker staining band. And again, we'll go over kind of what that looks like um, in two more slides with a picture. Uh, the lighter bands only contain actin because actin is a much thinner filament, so it'll be just lighter in color. And we call the light bands the I bands, and they extend toward the center of the sarcomere to the ends of the myosin filaments. The darker staining bands are called A bands, and they extend the entire length of your myosin filaments. And your myosin is a much thicker protein filament, so it will naturally appear darker under a microscope. And again, the actin and myosin myofilaments will overlap for a little bit of time at both ends of the A band. And this, again, the overlap of our actin and myosin, and then they're sliding past each other will cause contraction.
So when we kind of, we're gonna zoom in and kind of focus on just acted right now, but our act is kind of made up of three key components um, that have tricky names, but you need to keep track in your head. Um, the actin itself, and then two proteins, which are troponin and tropomyosin. Um, troponin molecules have binding sites for calcium. So right away, if you can get into your head, troponin binds calcium. Um, so troponin is the molecule that will bind to calcium. And tropomyosin, this kind of protein filament, will block myosin binding sites on the actin. And I'll show you a picture of this. So tropomyosin is kind of what needs to move out of the way for myosin to attach. And then the myosin myofilaments um, look like bundles of tiny golf clubs. We call them the thick filaments. And the myosin heads, kind of the head of the golf club region, will have a site to bind ATP, ATPase, as well as actin. So let's finally see what we're talking about here in the picture. So let's look kind of at the sarcomeres. So again, you know, the muscle fiber is the muscle cell. And we've pulled out a myofibril, which is made up of your actin and myosin proteins. And if we zoom in, kind of, we see how one sarcomere is labeled here. And let's zoom in on that one sarcomere. And again, the sarcomere is the smallest functional contracting unit of skeletal muscle. And it's made, uh, or it spans the length from one Z disc, which is this blue zigzag line that I'm coloring over, to the next Z disc. So I just colored this blue Z disc red. So that's one sarcomere. The Z disc serves as the boundary of sarcomere, and it also is attached to these purple actin myofilaments. Um, so that's what the sarcomere is. And if we look at another sarcomere right next to it, we start to label some of these regions where the I band consists of only those purple actin filaments. You'll see the M line goes right down the middle. The M line kind of serves as the center of your sarcomere, and it will be what your uh, myosin attached to. The H zone is only myosin filaments. The myosin filaments you can see are the thicker, greener proteins. And then the A band includes kind of the um, H zone as well as some overlap with actin. So that's kind of the different zones that make up a sarcomere. And then if we zoom in on individual actin myofilaments, also known as your thin filaments, they're in purple, and the myosin myofilaments are the thicker filaments. They're shown in green. You can see how you have several myosin molecules bundled together to form one myosin thick filament. And you can see here, they do look like golf clubs. You kind of have the head region. And at this head region, you'll have a spot where the head will kind of reach up and attach to actin. You'll also have a spot for ATP and ATPase to attach to the head region. And then the rod is just like the golf club rod, the longer end. And then the actin is where we get these fun T words. So the um, actin itself, the actin strands look like kind of um, strings of pearls that are wound around each other. Those are in purple. The troponin you can see here are these red proteins that are attached to actin. Remember, troponin are important for binding to calcium. And the tropomyosin, I always describe tropomyosin as kind of the long spaghetti-like structures. So you can see here that the tropomyosin right now are covering up these attachment sites. So if you look really closely, you see little tiny yellow dots on the actin strands. And those yellow dots are the attachment sites where the head of the myosin molecule will reach up and grab a hold of the actin that way. When your myosin head reaches and attaches to these attachment sites on the actin, the head will then kind of pull the actin so it can slide past it. And when your skeletal muscles are relaxed, when they're not contracting, tropomyosin will cover up those attachment sites so that myosin cannot bind to actin. So there will be no contraction when your skeletal muscles are resting. Okay, so how do our skeletal muscles contract? A lot of things happen. 
Um, but the first thing that needs to happen is we need to be able to give some sort of nervous stimulus. We need to excite our skeletal muscles to, to contract. So think about we need to like send an electrical charge through our muscle fibers so they can contract. This is all under nervous system control. And we describe the electrical charge difference across the cell membrane of a resting or an unstimulated muscle cell. We call it the resting membrane potential. And muscle cells, muscle fibers have a resting membrane potential, but they can also perform an action potential. And when we say performing an action potential, that means that those skeletal muscle cells can be excited, they can be fired, they can be stimulated to contract. That's what an action potential is. The resting membrane potential at rest is due to the inside of the membrane always being more negatively charged in comparison to the outside of the membrane. And an action potential or a skeletal muscle will contract well, that will happen when the membrane kind of opens up different channels and different ions will rush into the muscle cell. So the resting membrane potential, again, at rest before muscle contracts, the resting membrane potential exists or it's established by the concentration of potassium ions being higher on the inside of the cell and the concentration of sodium ions being higher on the outside of the cell. And this kind of concentration of different ions in and out of the cell is very important. It will help us understand contraction of skeletal muscles, and it will also help us understand how your nerves respond to stimuli in general. But remember, I told you the resting membrane potential always has a negative charge to it and it's more negatively charged inside of the cell due to large proteins inside the cell that are negatively charged and they're too big to exit. We have some leak protein channels, so protein channels that are always kind of open and they're constantly leaking kind of excess potassium out of the cell to keep this resting membrane potential where it should. So normally, because we have sodium outside of the cell at a greater concentration, when your muscle cells are stimulated to contract, sodium will naturally want to diffuse into the cell because it will flow down its concentration gradient where there's less of it. And potassium will always tend to diffuse or move out of the cell down its concentration gradient. And in order to maintain, again, what we call the resting membrane potential, we always have to maintain these concentrations of sodium and potassium. And we do that by using an active transport process called the sodium potassium pump. And this is a pump that transfers three sodium out of the cell. For every two potassium, it transfers into the cell. And the sodium potassium pump maintains the electrical charge of the resting membrane potential so that more sodium are always outside of the cell and more potassium are always inside of the cell. And again, that's just incredibly important to keep those concentrations of ions so that when your membrane or when your um, cells are electrically stimulated to contract, sodium will rush into the cell and potassium will rush out. What we're going over now, we'll go over again in the nervous system, but the same kind of principles will apply. And I will kind of describe that when we, when we get there. So the resting membrane potential at rest, when your skeletal muscles are not contracting, we have this charge difference. And you can see the charge difference showed here extracellularly outside the cell is always more positive and intracellularly intracellular is always has a more negative charge because of these big proteins that are negative. And at rest, we see different channels. Um, sodium channels are in, in pink and potassium channels are in purple. They can be gated channels. So this is a gated channel because it's closed for the time being or a channel can be what we call a leak channel and the potassium channels are leak channels. So potassium is kind of always like leaking in and out of the cell, but we can also have potassium gated ion channels as well. 
So at rest, this is what the um, cell membrane looks like. We have more sodium outside the cell and we have more potassium inside of the cell. So this is what your cell membrane um, looks at rest in your um, skeletal muscle cells. Then to initiate um, a muscle contraction, the resting potential must be changed to an action potential. And an action potential just means that that cell is being fired upon, means it's being electrically stimulated to want to contract. Changes in our resting membrane potential will occur when we have different channels that are open, specifically gated channels. In a skeletal muscle fiber, for example, a nerve impulse, because remember your muscles are under nervous system control, a nerve impulse will tell sodium channels to open and sodium diffuses into the cell and down its concentration gradient, moving from an area where there's more sodium outside the cell and it rushes into the cell down its concentration gradient where there's less sodium. So that is what happens kind of as a first step when your skeletal muscles are contracted, a nerve impulse opens sodium channels and sodium moves into the cell. So that's kind of the first step. When sodium ions move into the cell, you'll notice here that sodium has a positive charge to it. So it brings its positive charge with it. So then it makes the inside of the cell membrane to become more positive. And this increase in positive charge due to sodium ions rushing into the cell is called depolarization. And if depolarization changes your membrane potential enough to a value that we call threshold, an action potential will be triggered and that action potential will be a rapid change in electrical charge across the membrane that stimulates the muscle to contract. So that is what occurs um, in order to contract and stimulate your skeletal muscles, sodium needs to enter the cell and that's caused by usually a nervous stimulus. So again, depolarization during an action potential is when the inside of the cell becomes more positive because sodium moves into the cell. And at the end of depolarization, the positive charge actually causes your sodium channels to close. So no more sodium can get in. And at this point, potassium channels open. When potassium channels open, potassium also has a positive charge. Potassium is always going to want to leave the cell and move down its concentration gradient. So when potassium channels open, potassium will leave the cell. When potassium leaves the cell, it takes its positive charge with it and the membrane starts to repolarize again and become more negative. So repolarization is due to potassium leaving the cell. Potassium leaves the cell with its positive charge and it returns the cell back to its normal negative resting membrane potential conditions. And in a muscle fiber, an action potential will result in a muscle contraction. So here we have the first step of an action potential, depolarization which occurs when an electrical charge opens up sodium channels and sodium rushes into the cell. So the inside of the cell becomes more positive than the outside. So, um, or more positive than negative. So that's what depolarization is. And you can see here in step two, the inside of our cell membrane now is more positive as sodium, which has a positive charge, is rushing into the cell. In repolarization, you can see that the pink sodium channels have closed, but now potassium gated channels have opened and potassium rushes out of the cell. And look and remember that potassium has a positive charge to it. So when all these potassium ions leave with their positive charge, the inside of the cell becomes more negative again. And that is shown here in number three. So repolarization restores the membrane potential back to normal resting conditions, which again is, is more negative. So this takes you through kind of the three steps that occur during resting, depolarization and repolarization. Spend some time studying this, which ion channels open and close during each step and what the inside of the cell membrane, what the charge is at each step, because this is really important
for understanding muscle contraction. And this kind of key concept will carry over to how our nervous cells, our nervous system cells kind of send off signals as well. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, we go over this again um, in the nervous system as well. So how do our muscles get connection to our nervous system? Well, a motor neuron, so we kind of have two types of neurons, ones that can sense information and ones that initiate an action potential or a response. Those are called motor neurons. A motor neuron is a nerve cell that stimulates your muscle cells. And the neuromuscular junction is the synapse or the connection space where the fiber of a nerve connects with a muscle cell. And the synapse just refers to the cell-to-cell -cell junction or connection between the nerve cell and either another nerve cell or an effector cell. In our case, we're talking about a muscle, but it could also innervate or connect to a gland. And a motor unit is a group of muscle fibers that a motor neuron will all stimulate. So some more kind of um, terminology, and then I'll show you a picture of what all I mean here. The presynaptic terminal will be the end of the neuron cell, axon fiber. The synaptic cleft is the space between the presynaptic terminal of the nerve and the postsynaptic membrane of the muscle that it's innervating. So the postsynaptic membrane is the muscle fiber membrane in our case, that's called the sarcolemma. And the synaptic vesicle, so because there's, so there's a nerve coming in and it's connected to a muscle fiber, but there's a space in between called the synaptic cleft. They're not directly connected. So in order for the nerve to communicate with the muscle fiber, we have specific neurotransmitters, which are chemicals stored in synaptic vesicles. And your presynaptic terminal of your nerve releases these vesicles to travel across the synapse. These vesicles release neurotransmitters and the neurotransmitters will, what will be what will bind to the postsynaptic membrane, either the muscle fiber or the nerve that is innervating itself. So the neurotransmitters are chemicals that stimulate or inhibit the postsynaptic cells. And specifically, we're talking about skeletal muscles and acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that stimulates or starts the contraction of a skeletal muscle. So let's talk about what I mean here. So again, we're, we're talking about the neuromuscular junction, which is the connection between your nerve and between your muscle. And they're not directly connected. There's a space between the two. You can see here the axon of a nerve coming down, having branches, which we call the presynaptic terminals. And if we zoom in on this connection piece between the presynaptic or axon terminal and the muscle fiber itself, we see the sarcolemma, which is the cell membrane of your muscle fiber. We see the presynaptic terminal, which is the end of your nerve. And inside that, you see the synaptic vesicles. The synaptic vesicles will be what we, will be released to travel across the synaptic cleft, which is the space between the two. And the postsynaptic membrane is just the sarcolemma itself. You'll see mitochondria in each kind of cell. And it's fun to see this under a light microscope because you see an axon branch the axon terminal is making up this neuromuscular junction as the axon um, will stimulate this skeletal muscle fiber. So that's the neuromuscular junction. The function of the neuromuscular junction, so again, how do we pass on a signal from our nerve to our muscle? Well, we have an action potential, which is the signal itself. It travels down the neuron. And this action potential will open calcium channels. And when calcium channels open, calcium moves into that um, nerve ending or the axon ending, the presynaptic terminal. And the movement of calcium into the axon will cause the vesicles to release their neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. And you can see here, these little circles are the neurotransmitters. Um, this one is acetylcholine, often abbreviated ACH. 
Acetylcholine is a special chemical that then binds to a receptor molecule on the sarcolemma of your muscle fiber. And when acetylcholine binds, that usually initiates another action potential in the muscle fiber itself. Um, that action potential is initiated by opening up sodium channels and sodium will rush into the cell, causing depolarization. So that is the function of the neuromuscular junction and kind of the steps that occur um, to initiate and start a muscle contraction. So we describe the neuromuscular junction and how the nerve is attached to a muscle cell. And now we'll talk about how the muscle actually contracts after it's been stimulated from the nerve. So if we go back one picture, we can see here that we've started an action potential in the muscle due to the binding of acetylcholine and sodium rushing into the cell. That action potential that we've started will then travel down, um, and this is actually still describing the neuromuscular junction. The action potential travels down the axon of the motor neuron to the presynaptic terminal, causes calcium channels to open, Calcium causes the synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine binds to the receptor sites, sodium channels open, and sodium rushes into the muscle cell, and this causes depolarization. So those three steps describe these steps that we just talked about at the neuromuscular junction. Then we're going to kind of move past that. Sodium causes your sarcolemma and T-tubules to increase the permeability of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum will now release calcium that it stores. And calcium is incredibly important for muscle contraction because it binds to that troponin, which is the protein on actin. When calcium binds to troponin, it moves the tropomyosin off of those binding sites so that myosin heads can then bind to actin. And I'll show you pictures of this. ATP will be released from myosin heads and the heads bend towards the center of the sarcomere and the bending forces will slide or pull actin past the myosin. Acetylcholine and esterase is a special enzyme that breaks down excess acetylcholine so that sodium channels can close and muscle contraction can stop. This is a really important enzyme because if we don't get rid of the excess neurotransmitter, your muscles will stay contracted constantly. So let's talk about this step-by-step, step, what happens during skeletal muscle contraction. So first, let's talk about the action potential traveling along an axon membrane to the neuromuscular junction. Calcium channels open and calcium enters the presynaptic cell or the presynaptic terminal. When calcium enters, that causes acetylcholine to be released from the synaptic vesicles into the space to travel across the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine binds to these sodium channels and that causes sodium channels to open so that sodium can rush into the muscle fiber, causing depolarization to occur or the beginning of an action potential. This action potential, sodium diffuses into the muscle fibers and it initiates an action potential, which then jumps down the sarcolemma and eventually the action potential jumps into the T-tubules. And the T-tubules, remember, go into the center of your muscle cell. And when the action potential goes into the T-tubules, that causes calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this calcium is what will be important for the, your muscle contraction because the calcium that's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum will bind to the troponin molecules. So here we have a calcium molecule binding to a red troponin. And when that occurs, it moves the tropomyosin, which is this long, lighter blue spaghetti-like structure. It exposes now the myosin binding sites, which are those little yellow circles on actin. Those binding sites now are exposed so that the head of the myosin 
can reach up, attach to actin, and the head will kind of make this bending movement down. And when it does that, it will pull actin along to shorten the muscle fiber. So the heads of the myosin myofilaments will bend when they attach to these yellow binding sites. That causes actin to slide past the myosin. And as long as there's calcium present, the cycle will continue repeating. And your muscles will consistently um, continue contracting. So we need ATP or energy for muscle contraction. And ATP is made by our mitochondria. And that's why we'll find lots of mitochondria in our muscle cells. So energy for muscle contraction is supplied by ATP and energy will be released when we kind of chop ATP in half. We'll take off a phosphate group. ATP is always stored in myosin heads and ATP will help to form the cross bridge and the cross bridge formation just describes the connection between the head of the myosin and the actin itself. A new ATP is always required to release the myosin from the actin itself. So this is where we get to um, a process called rigor mortis, which is the stiffening of your body at death. So, um, and this is a good way scientists, medical examiners use to see how long a person has been dead based on how stiff their muscles are. That stiffness of your muscles is called rigor mortis. And that occurs because at death, your cells are no longer producing ATP. So muscles that are contracted, new ATP is always needed to relax the muscles, to detach the myosin from the actin. And at death, new ATP is not being created. So your myosin and actin remain contracted, connected to each other, but causes stiffening of the muscles at death because there's no ATP to cause that disconnection. Um, eventually, the muscles do relax because the proteins, AT, or the actin and myosin just break down. So eventually that cross bridge um, is detached but rigor mortis is called stiffening at death of the muscles. Um, and it can be used to show medical examiners how long a person has been dead, for example. So this is just a breakdown of um, how ATP gets broken apart and um, the cross bridge movement occurs. So if we zoom in on step one, active sites so that the myosin heads can bind are exposed when calcium binds to troponin and that moves the tropomyosin off of the active sites. The cross bridge is formed, which is when the myosin heads bind to the exposed active sites. And then the power stroke is what we call when the myosin head bends and kind of pulls the actin past it. And this is where ATP is required. Um, an ATP molecule will bind to the myosin head, causing the detachment from the actin. Um, ATP is then hydrolyzed or broken apart to get the head of the myosin back to its starting position, just so that um, the cycle can continue. So this is called kind of the cross bridge cycling movement of how myosin keeps attaching to actin, sliding it past each other so that your actin and myofilaments can contract and shorten and the cycle will continue over and over again. A muscle twitch is a single contraction of a muscle fiber in response to a stimulus. And we're going to talk a little bit about the stages or phases of a muscle twitch because this will help us understand how your muscles contract. Um, it has three phases. The latent phase is the time between application of a stimulus and the beginning of a contraction. The contraction phase is when the muscle actually contracts. And the relaxation phase is the time during which your muscle relaxes. So these are the three phases of a muscle twitch, which is a single muscle contraction, the lag or latent phase, contraction phase, and relaxation phase. And twitches because we can stimulate your muscles um, kind of with more than one stimulus at a time. We can sometimes run into problems if your muscles are contracting for too long. And that's what the following slides take us through. Um, when we talk about a summation, you have individual muscles are contracting more forcefully 
So you'll have more muscle cells being recruited if you are, you know, bench, what is it, bench pressing or weightlifting, you know, a huge amount, you'll have more muscles being contracted forcefully to try to lift that weight. Tetanus or tetany is a sustained muscle contraction that occurs when the frequency of a stimulation is so rapid that no relaxation occurs. And some drugs and poisons cause tetany of your muscles. And that's something you do not want your muscles to go in because it means they'll never relax. And recruitment is the idea of stimulating several motor units to kind of recruit muscle fibers to all contract as a unit. Again, in cases when you're trying to lift something heavy, for example. So this describes what we call multiple wave summation. Here we have the frequency of skeletal muscle kind of contractions. We have a single twitch. We have incomplete tetany where you'll see kind of the, um, the twitch go down a little bit and relax. That's incomplete tetanus. But complete tetanus, you just see this sustained muscle contraction with no dip down in the graph. Because remember, anytime the graph went down, that considered was considered a relaxation phase. So complete tetanus is not something you want your muscles um, to go into. Okay. Um, skeletal muscle fibers were through a couple more slides and then we'll take a break. So I promise I won't go longer than an hour because I know more than an hour lecturing and listening on Zoom is just hard to take in. Um, so your, your muscle fibers can twitch either slowly or fastly. Fastly is not a word. Um, but slow twitch fibers will contract slowly and fatigue slowly. They have a considerable amount of myoglobin, which stores oxygen. And they use aerobic respiration to contract, meaning they contract in the presence of oxygen. Um, they are darker in color, and you'll find a lot of slow twitch fibers in long distance runners, for example. So every kind of muscle fiber has both types of muscle fibers, whether they're slow twitch or fast twitch. But if you are a long distance marathon runner or an Ironman trainer, you, your muscles have been trained to kind of gather or produce or be kind of populated with more of these slow twitch fibers that contract slowly and fatigue slowly. They're darker in color. Um, they don't tire out as easily because they always use aerobic respiration. So they'll contract in the presence of oxygen. And we'll see this in your parts of the body that are more in, for endurance purposes. So we'll find a lot of slow twitch fibers in your calf muscles to help you stand or in the muscles of your back to help you stand upright to keep your back erect. And we'll also see slow twitch fibers that are darker in color in different parts of poultry that you might eat. So for example, the dark meat in chickens and turkeys will be slow twitch fibers. And these are the parts of the bird that fatigue slowly. So for example, parts are the dark meat, um, the thighs, the legs, that's where your dark meat is in poultry. They're darker in color because they have more um, kind of oxygen and blood flow. The myoglobin gives it a darker color, but those are the parts of the bird that are fatiguing more slowly because they're using um, their legs to walk around all the time. Fast twitch fibers contract quickly and they fatigue quickly and they contract via anaerobic respiration in the absence of oxygen, and they're much lighter in color because they don't have all that myoglobin content, and they're used by sprinters. So if you're a sprinter or someone who does, um, you know, really quick reps of an exercise, kind of the one and done thing, muscles will be kind of pr produced or they will produce more fast twitch muscle fibers, and they're lighter in color. So where do we find the light or whiter meat in a chicken or a turkey, you'll find it in the breast meat um, because they're not doing anything. Um, turkeys and chickens do not fly, so they're not using their um, breast meat a lot. So that's where you'll find um, fast twitch fibers. A muscle will have a blend of both types of fibers, usually one type dominating, depending on how your activity level is and if you're running marathons or not. And humans have both types of fibers and the distribution can be genetically determined. So this is something interesting. You know, if you are a marathon runner, part of it is your training and your um, determination. I think a lot of it is mental. 
if you're any sort of endurance type athlete, even the Tour de France people, you know, cycling on their bike for days and hours. But it's also genetically determined how these fibers are distributed. Um, and that, you know, genetic determination can be passed down. So if your dad or mom was a runner or an endurance trade athlete, maybe you got those genes and can be that too. Um, energy for muscle contraction. We'll go about five more minutes here, guys. Um, muscle fibers are very energy dependent cells, whether they're at rest or during any form of exercise. And this energy comes from oxygen, and we call that aerobic ATP production or anaerobic is means in the absence of oxygen. So when there's not enough oxygen present in your muscles, they can still produce energy. Um, but it's not as efficient. Your muscles to going aerobically using oxygen to produce, produce ATP are much more efficient. And ATP is derived from four processes in skeletal muscle. Um, aerobic production of ATP happens during most of exercise and normal conditions. So aerobic, again, under normal conditions and normal exercise, your skeletal muscles are using oxygen to create ATP. And it might switch over to um, not using oxygen during intensive short-term work. So if, for example, all of a sudden your body is out of its oxygen stores, it might switch over to an anaerobic production of ATP. And during short-term intensive exercises, um, there's a chemical process that occurs where you build up lactic acid in your muscles, and that's where you could feel a burning sensation in your muscles after a while because that lactic acid is being produced because your muscles have run out of oxygen. So that's where you get a burning sensation when you've been working out for a long period of time. Um, conversion of a molecule called creatine phosphate can be converted to create ATP or to adenosine triphosphates can make an ATP also during heavy exercise as well. Muscle fatigue is a temporary state of reduced work capacity, and without fatigue, um, muscle fibers would be worked to the point of structural damage to them and their supportive tissues. You know, muscle fatigue is normal. It's normal to rest your muscles. Um, people who are marathon runners, if you have run a marathon, you know, you'll notice you're, you are sore for days, maybe weeks after running a 26-mile race, and that's because you have not let your muscles rest during those three to six hours it's taken you to run a marathon. So your muscle fibers are damaged and they need time to heal. Um, so I run a marathon. I don't personally know if you're not genetically adept for it, if it's good for your body because you're, you're breaking apart your muscles pretty much. And you have to give you know a good month to just let yourself heal afterwards. But if you're genetically adept for it, people run marathons until they're 70, which is amazing. Um, mechanisms of fatigue include the acidosis and ATP depletion, either due to, you know, you're using up all your ATP or not creating enough ATP. Oxidative stress um, can produce fatigue, which is characterized by the buildup of excess reactive oxygen species, and local inflammatory reactions can cause muscle fatigue. And I think we'll talk about types of contractions and then we'll be done, I promise. Um, there's two types of muscle contractions. They can be isometric or isotonic. And an isometric contraction has an increase in muscle tension, but no change in its length. So for example, I want you to try right now to push against the wall of your office or your bedroom or your kitchen or wherever you're at right now. Are you able to move the wall of your house? If you are, maybe you need to get a stronger wall to your house. But an isometric contraction is when you're putting tension on your muscles, but the muscle isn't changing in length. So it's um, trying to lift a thousand pounds. You know, you're, there's tension on your muscles, but they're not lifting the weight. So that's isometric contraction. Um, an isotonic contraction has a change in mus muscle length with no, no change in tension. So an isotonic contraction is the ability to move a weight um, or just to move your arm up and down because there is a change in muscle length itself. And then concentric versus eccentric contractions. Concentric contractions would be an isotonic contraction in which muscle tension increases 
as the muscle shortens. So that would be really lifting something heavy. Your muscle tension is increasing, but you're still able to move it. So the muscle itself is contracting. And eccentric contractions are isotonic contractions in which tension will always be maintained, but the opposing resistance causes the muscle to lengthen. And I think we might stop with muscle tone. So we'll start next week um, talking about must not, yeah, next week on Monday with muscle tone. So we're, and we'll probably finish this and maybe start the next chapter, but we'll finish here with muscle tone. Um, and if you guys have me for lab, I'll see you in about half an hour next week. You know, to finish up this PowerPoint, we'll talk a little bit about smooth muscle, cardiac muscle. And then the rest of the PowerPoint is going through the different types of skeletal muscles and how we name them. And we'll be touching briefly on this in lab today as well. So we'll finish up this PowerPoint on Monday and we'll start chapter eight on your nervous um, tissue or your nervous chapter nine, your nervous system. So I'll go ahead and stop recording with that. Um, let me go ahead.